You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Basu Sundram, and with my co-host Ashley Kays, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career, and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Sanjay Singh. Sanjay has over twenty-three years of experience in building and leading teams to support sales and consulting functions at global MNCs such as Oracle, McKinsey, and IDC. He is skilled at business research, sales enablement, and knowledge management. Sanjay currently leads the bids and proposal management team at Genpact. Genpact is a global professional services firm that makes business transformation real for Fortune 500 companies. Over the last couple of years, Sanjay has redesigned and built the bid management center of excellence at Genpact. This transformation led to significant improvement on all bid management performance metrics. And won Genpact the APMP Best Bid and Proposal Team Award in 2019. Sanjay's earlier set up a sales intelligence center of excellence at Genpact, doing industry and company research, content creation, lead generation through CXO connection and competition intelligence. Wow, Sanjay is on the Association of Proposal Management APMP India Governing Board since January 2020. He is co-leading the Marketing and Comms Committee. And helping drive APMP India's growth strategy. Sanjay loves listening to podcasts. Regularly plays badminton and cricket. He has a bit of a green thumb and doing a community farming for organic vegetables. Ooh. He's based in Gurgaon since 1998 and has seen it evolve from a sleepy little town into a buzzing millennium city. Sanjay, there is so much to talk. Welcome to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me here. And with this, said Sanjay, let's go back to the very beginning, uh, Sanjay. Where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. Sure. Uh, well, I was born in a, a small town in uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh in India. Uh, it's known as UP. The town was uh, it's, it's called Azamgarh. Uh, that was my maternal grandmother's uh, place, right? But I was there very briefly, and then subsequently I moved to uh, Varanasi, also known as Banaras. It's a popular city in northern part of India. That's where the current Prime Minister of India uh, contests the elections from. That's his constituency, uh, and uh, he's been he's been winning from there. So it's actually uh, it's known as one of the oldest living cities in the world. I think it's the oldest living city in the world, Varanasi. So, so I did my schooling there uh, for till twelfth standard. I was in uh, in different schools, but uh, interesting story there as well. So initially, I was in a, a Hindi medium school, a local school close to my place, uh, and then after completing my fifth standard. I had an opportunity to go abroad to uh, Kenya, Nairobi. Right, my father uh, uh, he was a physics uh, professor in a college, so he applied for a two-year stint uh, in Nairobi University, and and we moved there for a couple of years. And that was actually a turning point as well because when I came back, uh, I I got the opportunity to move to a better school actually the best school in varanasi uh, which was an english medium convent school right so so that was a, a key turning point in my life wow so from uh, from where you were born to banaras and from banaras to kenya and from kenya back <laughs> there's a lot of journey there how was the migration when you were young from uh, going from india to africa Yeah, actually, it was uh, uh, it was good fun. Uh, so one thing I learned is that moving out of the comfort zone is is such a great learning experience, right? So when I moved from my uh, hometown here, from the Hindi medium school, my native language, to to Kenya, where everything was in English, the first month was a torture. You know, I I would go to school and. Uh, uh i i could not communicate in english uh, i was ridiculed and you know the student and staff all would you know kind of give me that look and uh, avoid me and i had to bank on another indian student there to do some amount of translation for me to get through that first you know maybe a month and uh 
you know, I, I came back, I used to come back to my father and uh, come back to the home and, 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 and I asked my father, hey, you know, why did we move here? Did you bring us all here for us to get embarrassed in front of everybody? <laughs> and and uh, he said, don't worry, we'll get over it and you will come all right out of this. So he got me admitted into an English tuition class. And uh, by then, the first session was ending. It was a trimester session there, right? So after the first three months got completed, uh, we went on a one month of leave. I, after that, I remember going back to school and I was uh, pretty good in English by then. And everybody was surprised, like, wow, man, no, you, you never told us that you knew English. I said, I did not know English. I just learned it over the last couple of months. It was a good story that way. Yeah, I think it's super important, isn't it? We all, because my native language is Tamil, right? But uh, when I, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I studied, uh, you know, my father put me in a convent, but then uh, it, it was still hard to, 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 to study everything in English when you speak everything at uh, Tamil at home. I, you know, applying learning language, which is outside your uh, thinking pattern and coming yeah. back and communicating. It's, it's a beautiful story there. Thank you. And and you yeah. finished your school in Benares, then is that where you did your uh, master? Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, bachelor's as well. Yeah. So after comp- so I stayed. I stayed in Kenya for two years, and uh, by the end of that, uh, I was pretty good in studies there. Uh, While well, the education system was also relatively easy compared to India, so I scored seventh position in the entire country in the board exam, uh, the seventh standard board exam over there, which was uh, such a high. And then when I came back, I got admitted to uh, the school here uh, in Varanasi again, St. John's School. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm seventh rank uh, student of Kenya. Uh, this is going to be cakewalk here as well. And lo and behold, <laughs> lo and behold <clears throat> I was struggling in almost all the subjects, you know, especially, uh, you know, uh, history, civics, geography, uh, Hindi. I had forgotten my Hindi by then. And the history, civics, geography is all, you know, kind of forgotten or, uh, uh, you know, very, very new for me when I'd come back. Uh, so I had to really, you know, I, I struggled to catch up and cope up and all my, you know, uh, perception of uh, being superior was all gone in the first, uh, you know, six or six odd months. And I, and I had to come up uh, back to the cup. But then that was a good learning again. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, my father invested a lot of time with me in 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 covering uh, in covering all those subjects. So I, I completed uh, my twelfth standard, uh, and and that was uh, by then, you know, I was able to come back. <clears throat> I used to consistently be in the top uh, ten, you know, seventh or eighth rank typically. Somehow seven number is uh, is a good number for me that way. <laughs> yes. So after, yeah. yeah. I think seven is a great number. I was born in 7th of October, Sanjay. So oh, I'm just going to be. <laughs> Greatness is associated with seven number, I believe. <laughs> yes. After school, how was the journey? Uh, yeah. So after school, uh, after school, I got uh, admission in BHU, uh, Banaras Hindu University. Oh. It's uh, it's a very large central university that's in Varanasi and pretty old as well, you know, before uh, Indian independence. Uh, it's an 18 square kilometer campus. It's a huge university. So I went on to do my uh, computer science undergraduation from there. Actually, there's a little bit of a story there as well. You know, my father wanted me to join his, be a student in his college, right? He was in a different uh, college on the other side of the city. And he wanted me to study physics and maths from his college. And I said, no, I have, I have to study computers. Uh, and I actually, you know, uh, argued with him and fought with him to get the computer science uh, mm. admission into that course. Uh, but it's, it's, it's good because then uh, uh, that was something which I was really passionate about and I was following my heart there. I said, I don't want to be studying uh, just physics and maths. It may be good, but then computers, computers were just coming in at that point in time, late 80s in India, they were making a mark, which later, uh, you know, with the, uh, the turn of the century, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, term, but that's when it really blossomed for for Indian economy, you know, where the entire growth was led by computer adoption. Totally. I mean, like at that point, computer science was the thing. 
how was it learning computer science in banaras in the university during the good old times oh it was good we had a lot of fun <clears throat> more fun than uh, studies actually <laughs> uh so we had a, a great gang and uh or the infrastructure was also new because it was just being introduced so good teachers good infrastructure uh i studied computers for four years and uh then uh, i had a change of heart uh because it was becoming too technical there, then and also i realized that after doing this i would end up either being a system administrator or a programmer and that's not what i wanted to do i i was more focused on you know in uh, uh you know a a job where i could use my knowledge of computers but still be in touch with the human side with you know working with people so so that's when i switched to uh, an mba course from the same university uh and again my father was uh, dead against it he said no you've studied computers now there are great job opportunities you should go on and take up a job and 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 uh, be a programmer i said no i want to do you know management i want to do sales and marketing uh, courses so after a while he gave up and then i i went on to do that again good learning a lot of ups and downs uh, the biggest downer was during mba uh, there were a couple of large political issues in india uh, uh, basket if you would remember the mm-hmm. reservation the anti reservation uh, you know movement and there was this temple issue uh because of those the session got delayed there were a lot of student unrest all over the country the job market suffered so those were a few of the downers there uh, due to which uh, there was a bit of a struggle in getting a job uh but then eventually i got a sales job in in delhi that's when i moved from uh, varanasi perfect you know yes that point was was challenging you know i passed out in 2002 that's where the 911 happened and situation we had a change of guard in in politics as well at that point so it was it was mm-hmm. and it was booming but it flat fall flat <laughs> not during the 2001 crisis it was uh, pretty challenging but uh, that's good from the sales roles you did manage to put yourself from in idc mckinsey and oracle maybe you could quickly run through your career yeah. timeline before you enter genpack yeah 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 uh well, the very first thing that i remember uh, from my job actually two things one was when i went uh, on to interview for a company that i took my first job with uh i was asked a very cliche question you know sell this pen to me mm. and i was like man that is such a cliche question but nonetheless i answered that got a job <laughs> along with other questions as well uh did that job for two years uh, did lot of uh, you know running around uh it was a sales job wherein i had to sell concepts right so uh optical mark recognition omr and ocr optical character recognition and barcoding mm-hmm. these were very new things in india and i had to co- do concept selling for these three uh products and services in, in delhi so it, it was very very difficult because you're trying to explain to people how these would be relevant for their use cases people just did not get it they thought it is irrelevant not needed too costly you know mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. almost every day was a disappointment i would come back uh, you know from from calls uh, not having closed a deal uh, so major learning there not to give up mm-hmm. uh, but it was tough those two years right and then towards the end of that two years stint i actually got a job in another company for a while wherein uh i was selling hardware products you know networking products lan and lan and van switches and routers and and uh, hubs uh and uh, connected upcs uh there uh, one interesting incident i remember there was the first day on that job i actually landed up my at my competitor and i tried to sell my <laughs> my wares to to competitor and i could see the amused look on their faces and i'm like why are these guys amused you know uh they were they were playing along they got all the uh, info from me and then after you know about 20 odd minutes they said okay we are a competitor and you have very graciously shared everything thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> wow so 
what I learned is that you need to do research on your, not only your clients or your prospects, but you need to do research on your competitors as well. You have to be very thorough about that to succeed in, in, in sales role, especially, but all roles nonetheless. 100%, 100%. So how long were you there at IDC before you moved to McKinsey? Well, well I, uh, I then moved to IDC. IDC was a market, IDC is a market research company, International Data okay. Corporation. Right. Uh, they, they publish uh, market research reports on variety of IT and telecom and related services. I was there for about three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was leading their telecom and uh, networking research in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting job. That's when I fell in love with research, right? So bulk of my career uh, is actually in market research, business research, uh, financial research. So that that's what started at IDC. Mm-hmm. I did that for about three years. Uh, and then I got referred by an ex-friend, a colleague of mine from IDC. I got referred to McKinsey. McKinsey had set up a knowledge center in India mm-hmm. in, in 99 and 2000 beginning was when I got referred by that friend of mine who had actually gone to McKinsey as well. Right. So he, he pulled me there uh, and, and I moved to McKinsey. That's a, that's a transition from a market research company to McKinsey who everybody knows McKinsey, right? How was the transition? Oh, yes. I mean, McKinsey is the best. Uh, it's the tops. So just uh, the McKinsey experience is something that you remember, even if you spend like, you know, uh, a year or two in McKinsey, uh, you remember that for the rest of your life. Mm. It, it was a transformational experience. The the strong values that they live by, you know, the strong focus on uh, employees who are actually considered equal to clients, right? So clients and employees both are given equal weightage and value. And, uh, uh, you know, superb focus on employee uh, development on on learning and knowledge building skill building that was a the massive uh, focus that i saw I mean, no, no other company that i've come across does it uh, with as much uh, you know money and and focus and uh, passion as as they do mm-hmm. and uh, so in mckinsey i was there for 6 years uh, I was leading their telecom research uh, capability, which mm. was being set up. And that was a research role. <clears throat> Again, uh, I was supporting telecom uh, engagement, telecom media, high-tech engagements globally with uh, with my research, right? So consultants on the client side would uh, be in touch with me regularly to do uh, research, primary research, secondary research, a lot of secondary research and a little bit of primary research as well. To, to feed that back into their uh, deliverables that they were preparing, right? And uh, after transitioning this from a consult uh, a, a research team in North America, uh, I expanded that to cover the rest of the world. I had a largest team here, about you know fifteen odd people spread all over the globe, with uh, with you know global team. So people stationed in Australia, Japan, China, Korea who reported to me. So that was, again, uh, like I said, a transformational uh, six-year stint with McKinsey in their Knowledge Center. Wow. And from Knowledge Center, uh, was Oracle a similar role as well? Or uh, is a very different role in Oracle? Uh, Well, slightly different. The common thread was uh, the research. So again, uh, with the McKinsey Knowledge Center, uh, you know, I, I was I was not looking to move abroad, but there were multiple opportunities to move abroad from McKinsey. Uh, almost everybody in my peer group had moved to uh, US, but uh, for my personal reasons, because my dad had just passed away, and I could not leave my mom behind. So because of uh, you know personal reasons, I could not leave the country. I, I had to be in India, uh, and beyond a certain limit, I couldn't. Uh, I mean, there was not much of a role in in the McKinsey Knowledge Center. So a a colleague of mine referred me again, a lot of, you know, power of referrals and connections and network. I got referred to uh, Oracle. Uh, Oracle was setting up a new team in India to support their global sales uh, function. So they needed a lot of uh, uh, research, company profiling, uh, 
you know, value briefs to be created, lead generation outside in consulting engagements, remote consulting engagements. Uh, so, so they needed that capability. So I, along with a couple of other people, set it up in India and, and grew it. Uh, I spent about nine years uh, in Oracle in India supporting global sales. So it was, again, good fun. A lot of uh, building from scratch capabilities that did not exist. Uh, a lot of... Uh, struggles because uh, we, you know, uh, Oracle is organized uh, as Oracle India and Oracle Global and Oracle Global, which is Oracle, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the entire software development arm, that's in Bangalore. But our team was in Delhi. Now in, in Delhi, we weren't officially like legally part of Oracle India. So, so we had to have all of the setup, you know, uh, built up from grounds up. And, and that was uh, exciting because it was a bit of a startup kind of feeling initially. So we didn't have proper, uh, you know, office. It was in a business center. Uh, equipments were difficult to get. You know, all of those startup issues that, that uh, you know, people face, we faced it while being part of a large corporate, you know, la large global MNC. So it was uh, extremes, you know. On one side, we were part of Oracle, but on the other side, we were, Actually not, because you are uh, having to do things from scratch. Uh, building policies, because they, they existed either for the Bangalore Development Center, which was like several thousand people. Uh, but the India operations was only sales operations, so we weren't part of it. So interesting uh, learnings and, and journey over there. Definitely, Sanjay. I think it just tells you like how versatile you are, uh, you know, moving from different roles and taking up different types of opportunities, experiencing different cultures, different time zones. <laughs> so uh, do you have any including GenPact? How was the transition? And then we will talk about any memorable or interesting projects that you have across IDC, GenPact, and also, you know, McKinsey or Oracle. Sure. Um... Uh, after spending nine years in Oracle, uh, I again, through power of network and connections, I got referred to uh, Genpack. Genpack was uh, again setting up this capability, the research capability. Uh, it, it was fairly raw uh, at that point in time in 2018, uh, 2014, uh, and they were looking for a research team leader. So I, I moved, I joined Genpact in January 6, uh, January 15, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, initially when, when you know, I, I saw that this is a bit of a, you know, mix of McKinsey and an Oracle uh, and large company, you know, it was about 65,000 people at that point in time when I joined Genpact, but it was still like a startup-ish culture because the, the pace of change was huge and it was uh, the the decision making execution governance was all uh, with, within a, a small group of uh, you know avps and above which gave that uh, you know flavor of a startup and every day was different compared to oracle where things were fairly stable things were you know at even keel there were a lot of policies and processes uh, in genpact things were very rapidly changing, you know, state of flux. Uh, one interesting project from Oracle. So Oracle, we we created a remote business case generator, uh, which could run actually, if you just, you know, uh, press a few buttons on that platform, you, you would be able to create a, uh, an end-to-end -end business case uh, on, uh, on, on that platform. Uh, it had, you know, uh, one source running at the back end. It's like a capital IQ kind of a platform running at the back end with a lot of collaterals <clears throat> by industry, by capabilities woven into it. So like internal repository and an external database connected together, uh, wherein you chose what company you're targeting in what vertical, uh, what challenges are they facing? And you would be able to then create an end-to-end deck which did your industry research, which had your company research, which had your company strategies and objectives, company challenges, company financials, P 
pure comparison of the company with its uh, competitors. And uh, for that kind of a company, what Oracle has done, the benefit delivered, you know, case studies, et cetera. So all of that could be done in click of few buttons. And, and that was a huge uh, success. Uh, I, I believe it's still being used in an improved uh, version as of now. So, so that was an interesting project that I did in Oracle. In Genpack, every day is interesting. I can I can spend the entire day talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's super fascinating. Even visualizing what you just told me was in a click of buttons, we are able to bring in everything about competition, everything about customer in 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 like in like that. I think companies spend as you know three months, four months standing in three, four guys to do capture assessment and stuff. Whereas uh, uh, the market research and the overall competitive research has moved so advanced where uh, anything that's publicly available, we could get things done in click of a button. It's fascinating to hear. Uh, um, and this was done a few years ago as well, as you, as you said, imagine now how uh, the best in class companies manage, um, you know, competitive information and also their own, uh, you know, the customer strategy and implementation. That's brilliant. Um, and is that what uh, you took forward? Because you did mention in Genpack, you created two centers of excellence. One is the the competitive intelligence or uh, related excellence. And the second one is the bid and proposal center of excellence. Yes. Yeah. So, so first was an, first one was a research center of excellence. Uh, uh, it's called uh, growth uh, intelligence unit. Uh, in that team, uh, you know, there is research that is done for industries, for accounts, for buying centers in those accounts, and for people in those buying centers. Right at that level of granularity, research is done in those areas. So secondary research. A uh, lot of uh, capturing of triggers, right? So uh, I, I uh, developed a platform along with a vendor, a platform wherein real-time triggers would be captured for our target accounts. Uh, so I'll give an example. Suppose we are going after, uh, say, ABC Corporation, right? Mm -hmm. ABC Corporation is, uh, is an account. The seller is, say, John Doe, right? Now we had that mobile app, which would be customized for everybody in the sales function. And John Doe had ABC company on his phone on that particular app, right? Now, any changes that happen in ABC company, whether it's merger or acquisition or, or uh, CXO movement inside or outside, uh, any financial uh, uh, information, uh, financial uh, you know changes or financial stresses, uh, any business operating changes or any big announcements uh, pertaining to uh, outsourcing. Multiple of those things were coded into the platform. It would catch all of that from public sources. You know, it was continuously crawling about 40,000 odd sources uh, all over the web mm -hmm. and would immediately flag it into the app to, the, to that seller. So seller would real time get to know, okay, this particular thing has happened in the account, right? And that would immediately alert the seller to have a conversation with the CXO in the client organization. So that was one. The second thing was uh, tracking of connections, right? Uh, an app that was able to map connections from, from uh, Genpact to the client uh, C-suite and the board. Uh, and you know, connections would be through our senior folks, through our board members. Uh, and so for the seller, it gave them a route to reach to their target CXO uh, using that network, right? So net, use, use the network, use the trigger that you've just got, boom, you are in a position to have a conversation real time before even anybody gets to know about it. You're already talking about that thing. So <laughs> I know it, it's going to freak out everybody. Most people use Excel spreadsheet to just do Google search to <laughs> just find what they can do here. But this is this is super nice, uh, Sanjay. I mean, like with, with the wealth of information, is it also been lifted and dropped into uh, how we write proposals and other things? You know, you 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 played a very important role in also structuring the the bid uh, proposal center of excellence as well. Uh, yeah. how, how was that influenced by this? Yeah, no, that's an interesting story as well. So after having uh, done, having led that research center of excellence for uh, for close to three years, uh, 
I was I was then looking to do something else. You know, roughly three to four years is when I start getting a little you know uh, jittery when I want to do something uh, different, something more challenging. So I had done that for about three years, and I was looking to do something else. And at that point in time, uh, the proposing capability, uh, which was actually outside of uh, outside of my current uh, group, business group, it was outside of that group. Uh, it was brought into this uh, business group, and I was, uh, you know, I was asked by my boss that hey, uh, we want to fix this function. Uh, we have had this function, but there are challenges in how Genpact uh, runs its uh, bits and proposals. Uh, you know, can you take that as a challenge and 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 fix it? I said uh, yes. Uh, of course, I took a few few hours to think about it because that's something I <laughs> I had not thought. I mean, all my background was research, and here I was uh, expected to move down the cycle. You know, from lead generation and uh, deal surfacing uh, to now deal shaping and proposal creation and bid management, right? So, but it was exciting because I'm and I'm so glad that I took that uh, decision to move. It 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 just opened new avenues of learning and exposed me to actually the best of uh, uh, Genpact. And I think bid and proposal management is so central to everything that happens in the organization, right? You get exposed to sales and marketing, you get exposed to operations and delivery, to finance and commercial and legal and IT and HR and transitions, everything like you are in the center of the entire uh, corporate uh, or entire operation of a business uh, when when you are in a bid and proposal management role, it's it's a it's a it's a great uh, opportunity that came my way. I'm so thankful to God for that. Hundred percent. And uh, what's more, from that uh, important implementation, the team went on to win 2019 bid and proposal global mm -hmm. award from APMP as well. That that tells us the effort that has gone in. Uh, yes. Yes. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so when I when I took on this role, you know, uh, uh, we 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 engaged uh, an APMP uh, APMP approved training organization ATO hmm. to to look into uh, what needed to be done. Right. So we we conducted a couple of assessments, assessments of proposal quality, and assessment of people competency, and creation of a new target operating model. Uh, you know, we had to design and build it basically from scratch on the dimensions of uh, you know people and and skill building and dna change on the dimension of process again because processes were very ad hoc uh, people were just you know uh, were just order takers and coordinators right mm -hmm. they weren't true bid managers in in the in, in the way bid management is defined so the processes had to change. Everything had to be standardized. All deals were basically being treated the same way, whether it's a very small deal or a very large deal. Uh, every deal, you know, people spend the same amount of time, same amount of, uh, you know, uh, effort. There was, the standardization was missing and also differentiation because, you know, you have to treat a smaller deal in a more scalable manner using, uh, you know, standardized pieces, which are reusable. And, and invest more of your time and actually best of your people on those largest strategic deals because that's where uh, you know the the uh, the real meat is. So uh, standardization yet differentiated application on different types of deal, right? Uh, and and focus on transformation services opportunities, which is a big focus area. So it is an exciting journey. Last two and a half years, uh, I have been in this role, leading the bid and proposal management function. That the time has just flown. I like when I now sit back and think about it. Oh, this was in two thousand eighteen when I took it up. Wow, man, time has really uh, flown. Uh, but it's a it's a fabulous, uh, very satisfying journey. Totally, totally. I think we talked at length about your life, career, and the amazing stuff that you've done, both in research on. Oracle, McKinsey, and also IDC, then on Genpact doing both, uh, setting up the, um, uh, the research arm and also on the uh, bid and proposal center of excellence. Let's wind down a little bit. 
tell us the three things not many people know about you uh not many people know about me so one is that uh now no people know i was pretty bad in communicating <laughs> in english i and uh, because of that fear i i had a lisp i i used to stammer and i really hated uh you know that change but then i got over it and when when you when you fall down and you and you uh stand back again uh and when you see that you really able to dust off and move forward it it gives a lot of courage and confidence so i was uh, i was able to do that so that's number one uh the other thing also a lot of people actually most of the people don't know is that i tried to sell my product to a competitor it was such an embarrassing you know boo boo moment uh and a funny moment when i now look back but that's another one which i which i did uh uh well, i'm a uh, i'm a trained scuba driver diver Ooh. yeah so uh, grade 2 uh, scuba diver as well so i've done that in a, in 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 three locations all over the world so that's that's one wow i think uh, that's that's very unique scuba diving i mean like even in normal swimming pool i struggle to breathe <laughs> let alone do scuba diving it's amazing i think uh, just one one question on apmp and then we'll very quickly move on actually i'm so looking forward to talk all about these stuff that you just told me when did you join apmp as a member and talk us about your apmp in the boat journey so far and your plans absolutely so apmp when when i joined this uh, team as the team lead role in 2018 I had a team member who had an APMP foundation certification, and uh, uh, he had come from Microsoft. So he used to talk highly about APMP, and uh, I used to see the difference between him when when he managed uh, the deals uh, versus others. So, you know, he he really used that knowledge, and he used to come across as very uh, confident, very theoretically. Uh, uh buttoned up you know very correct uh, whereas everybody else was winging it you know playing it by the ear but he always followed you know some kind of a process and then then he talked about this uh 97 uh step process of of uh, uh business development and and bid management and i was very intrigued i said okay what is this uh, apmp and what do they do so uh with my ato partner uh i explored that i took up membership in the middle of uh, 2000 actually towards the end of 2018 i took up membership of eight, uh, apmp and i'm so so glad because it opened up uh, so many new vistas for me right i i was i got access to their free resources and webinars and conferences uh i got invited to actually uh, i i uh Uh, uh i applied to go to the bpc 2019 you know my my company approved uh, me going there that's when the nomination for the best team award was also opening up and i and i submitted my nomination there and and got selected so when i landed up in bpc uh you know in in 2019 may uh it, it was such a such a moment i i could you know network and meet many people uh a lot of people i that i'm still in touch with uh and and uh, access to you know best practices that that are uh, going a long way in the way uh, we are now running that uh, this operation in genpact perfect so i think that's an amazing journey i think what what you just shared and wish you all the good luck with all the apmp initiatives in the future i was there at dcbpm on your behalf sanjay if you remember <laughs> uh you know early this year uh, it was it was nice to see a lot of growth a lot of positive that's happening around mm-hmm. this you and team all the success there and over to ashley who will be talking about everything else which is all these interested more about you ajay thank you yeah sure so actually uh, just to complete the apmp story sorry baskar uh, uh you know the uh, apmp award and uh, the meeting with uh, with the apmp leadership group uh, in us uh you know gave me a lot of uh, confidence that 
you know, we're, we're doing well and we should actually contribute, contribute back to the community, share our learnings uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, APMP community in India or the, the bid and proposal community in India should benefit from it. And uh, uh, I was con contacted by KK, KKIR from APMP India. And uh, this is for a webinar. Th that's where I told my, you know, GenPact bid and proposal transformation story. And it was a webinar which was uh, received very well. And he said, hey, we are opening up for uh, governing board nomination shortly. Would you be interested? I said, okay, yeah, let me give it a try. And uh, I went for it. I got, got selected to the APMP India governing board. Uh, this was late 2019. Uh, and and uh, lo and behold, I was in a company of, uh, you know, great uh, professionals and some good friends as well. So people that I had known from the past, you know, Sam Singh, uh, Abhilasha, KK, uh, you know, some of these people and, and, and Bas uh, Shankar from RFPI. These are, these are guys that I already knew. So I was like, oh, wow, this is nice. Uh, good, good coming back, uh, coming together of friends. Um, and, uh, you know, like-minded professional. So uh, it, it was interesting. And then uh, soon after joining APMP governing board, we we had the CBPM event, the uh, uh, Conference of Bid and Proposal Manager, uh, Management. Uh, so this was in February. First, it was scheduled in February, and we were all very scared that in a month, how would we organize a, a conference of this scale? And uh, we were really questioning the need to do it so quickly, like not do a poor job. We wanted to be thorough about it and, you know, really plan for it. Uh, but then we all, you know, backed each other up, moved it by a month and we did it in, uh, sorry, it was earlier planned in January. We moved it by a month to end of February. And Baskar, that's when I got in touch with you again. Of course, you, you were part of the transformation journey when you had come over and in May of 2018, you had actually did that session with, uh, with, with Genpact, right? So, so thank you very much because that's, my, that's when my journey actually started. Uh, and then in 2019, when I got in touch with you for, organ, for you know, uh, organizing the award function at the India APMP event, uh, it was a, you know, good partnership with you and, and it was received very well. So thank you for representing me because, uh, you know, change at the last minute in my side, I had, I had a meeting with our CEO review meeting lined up. I could not come to, to the Mumbai event, but uh, I'm so glad and uh, grateful that you were there to hold it along with the others in the APMP board. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I think, you know, more will, this is just the beginning of a long journey, you know, would love to do more, but yeah, thanks for everything from my side as well. So uh, Ashley is all set for you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So it was so great to hear about your journey. Such an amazing career and APMP involvement. Um, we're going to lighten things up a little bit. This is our rapid fire nutters round after, you know, Howard Nutt. Um, and so just don't think too much about the questions. Quick rapid fire. No right or wrong answer. It will be fun. <laughs> All right, let me go. All right. So first we wanna talk a little bit about your hobbies and interests. Um, in the beginning, we heard that you like to play badminton and cricket. Can you tell us a little bit how you became interested in these sports and, and who you play with? Uh, yeah, so during my school days, I really didn't play much, meaning a little bit of gully cricket, we call it. Gully cricket is basically a, a, a small lane. And we used to play gully cricket, uh, but I actually came into playing cricket and badminton both when I moved to Gurgaon. We had a lot more open spaces there, a lot of playgrounds there, a lot of uh, like-minded people. And uh, uh, with my lifestyle, actually, I had gained a lot of weight and there were health issues cropping up. Uh, mm -hmm. When I uh, when my uncle encouraged me to move into badminton and he he's he at his uh, almost 70 years of age is still a national level senior player so wow. he encouraged me and and that was such a good move because badminton keeps you really on your toes you know literally and figuratively and uh, <laughs> it was it's good for uh, health and and uh, touch wood i'm still able to play well so, so thanks for that oh yeah that's amazing sounds like a great way to kind of stay healthy yeah, absolutely. And then uh, cricket uh, is on Sundays. So uh, Sunday morning, 
uh, when I take a break from my uh, from my badminton, I spent you know three four hours on the cricket ground, which is more gentle, manly game, leisurely. You know, we you, you relax and and uh, you spend time with friends and have good time in general. Oh, that's so nice. Um, we also learned that you have a little bit of a green thumb and you're doing some community farming for organic vegetables. Can you tell us a little bit about how that project started? Yeah, it, there is an interesting story actually behind that. One day, uh, this is about uh, six months back, uh, I woke up with a dream and, and I dreamt that I'm actually farming, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I mean, this is odd. I've never dreamt about farming the entire life. Uh, you know, my grandfather was a farmer. He was uh, a poor farmer in a small village uh, in, in our native place. But uh, other than that, I had no other farming connection. And when I, and I woke up, I told my wife, hey, I just dreamt about farming. And she said, like, what? Farming of all the things? And then, uh, you know, by about 10, this was a Sunday. And by about 10 a.m., I, uh, my wife got a call from her friend saying, uh, she has heard about this community farming initiative wherein uh, someone, the manager of the farm basically takes up a huge plot and, you know, cuts it up into smaller pieces and then uh, uh, lets it out on rent and you could do your own organic farming. And when she heard that at 10 a.m., she said, How, what a con- coincidence. And, um, you know, this uh, friend of mine just called. I said, bang on let's just go ahead and do it let's just at least go and see it so we we you know we took them along we went to the farm this is about 15 uh, kilometers away from from our place and this is while we stay in Gurgaon it, it's a uh, you know hustling bustling city it's a growing uh, millennium city but just 15 kilometers away we reached the foothills of Ravli uh, it's in a village uh, and uh, uh, it's so calm and serene and clean air. And it's like, wow, did we just, uh, you know, go through a portal and come mm-hmm. on the other side of the world where things are so different? And I said, okay, this is it. We're going for it. So so then every Sunday uh, afternoon and sometimes on Saturday afternoon, we come to the farm and, and do farming. Uh, and we grow a lot of veggies. Actually, uh, that plot, which we thought may not be sufficient for our family, actually now I'm able to grow veggies, which I have to, uh, you know, distribute to my friend circle. So it, it goes to about, you know, three or four or sometimes five households. Wow. <laughs> so much stuff that we're able to produce. Oh my goodness. What a very cool initiative. And it's amazing that you're able to produce, you know, so much food for, you know, multiple families. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we're curious, do you, you have a nickname that your friends and families have given you? Uh, yeah, uh, it's Mintu. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what does it, what is the significance of that? What does it mean? Well, uh, well, there are two things. Mint, mint is where you, you know, we use, you uh, manufacture coins, right? Mint, M-I-N-T. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. mint, mint is also a plant. So it's either of the two. I, I've never questioned. I've always believed that <laughs> I, I'm able to uh, generate money. So that's why I was called mint too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, so what is one trait that you like most about yourself? Uh, I'm able to relate to others and I'm able to see things from their perspective. Uh, mm. This I think is, is uh, something which holds me in good stead. Uh, the ability to see things from their perspective. I'm able to put people in myself in people's shoes, right? Where it comes in very handy when in bid and proposal uh, function, for example, because then I can see it, uh, what the client's hot buttons and challenges are, what are they looking mm-hmm. for, right? Yeah. Uh, and then same for my stakeholders as well. So, so that I think is, is a good one. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you were a cake, which cake would you be and why? <laughs> um, chocolate fudge yum <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah it's chocolatey warm yeah, <laughs> it sounds amazing uh, what is your favorite tv show uh breaking bad mm, that's a great uh, one <laughs> um if you could be invisible for a day what would you do uh, what would I do? I don't know. Maybe solve some terrorism problems for the world. You know, go over and, and mm-hmm. fix some 
some of the terrorists there, you know. Yeah, what a what a great thing to do. Uh, what is your favorite childhood memory? Riding the scooter with my father, and I used to stand on the footboard, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in front of him, mm-hmm. and uh, ride the ride the scooter, and I would try to block his view, and you know, the fun that <laughs> that was a great memory. Oh, that sounds like a really sweet memory. What is one common myth about our profession that you want to debunk? Uh, that it is a lot of coordination. That's a common myth. A lot of people think that it's, oh, it's just coordination, just managing calendars, chasing people. And it is not. It, it, there is a massive opportunity to do it uh, in a way that it is, uh, it is you know, a winning capability. It, it allows the bid manager to be front and center in the proposal and be the anchor, the driver, uh, ensure that the quality, the, re- the right quality comes out, which makes it a winning deal. That's a massive myth currently that, you know, bid managers are order takers and coordinators. It is not. Yeah, I agree. Um, who haven't you seen or talked to in a while and you hope that they're doing okay? Uh, mm-hmm. my brother mm. uh, he, he stays in uh, he stays in US uh, and I haven't spoken to him I think in a f- several months I should do oh, that wow. yeah, well, he, he's very busy I'm busy and he's on the other side of the world so the time zones are also a bit of a challenge we sometimes chat on WhatsApp but yeah speaking on phone is something that I need to do Oh, yeah, definitely. It can be difficult, you know, with the different time zones. And it sounds like you also work in the evenings a lot, too. So it can be challenging to find some time. Yeah. Um, what's the one food you could never bring yourself to eat? Uh, non-veg food, actually. I'm a vegetarian. So mm. the, 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 the only time I had vegeta- non-vegetarian food uh was uh you know in i think in a southeast asian country i think korea south korea i was in oh. seoul and they, they don't they don't have anything vegetarian so i kept on asking the 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 waiter there can i get something vegetarian and he was so confounded he just could not other than peanuts he could not get me anything and <laughs> i tried and i tried to have chicken uh it, it was uh, so awful but yeah oh no yeah, I bet that could um, be very difficult. Mm. Yeah. Um, have you ever sent a text to the wrong person? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in a, this happens all the time, uh, not all the time, several times when you are on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on Zoom calls, there is, a, there is a facility to send a message to a group, to the whole group or to a, to a certain individual in that call. Mm-hmm. Right? So once, once I was bitching about uh, the organizer of the call, and I was reaching to somebody and I sent that message to the whole group and I was like, oops. Ooh. <laughs> I had to apologize sense. after the call a whole lot. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, so we learned, you know, so much about your career and, you know, you talked a lot about, you know, the impact that your dad had on your life. Um, we're curious, who are the people who've been the most influential in your life and your career? Um, knowing your dad is probably one of them. Yeah, uh, there, was a, there was a maths teacher in uh, my school in Kenya, Mr. Jackson. Uh, he was a massive influence as well. The selfless devotion that he had towards the uh, studies and with his students amount of extra time that he spent with us taught mm-hmm. me a lot as well that you know you can you can really derive satisfaction from whatever you do as as long as you're pa- pa- passionate and honest about it so that was one uh, the other one is uh, my former super boss in genpack uh, ahmed mazari he's actually president of microsoft asia right now uh, he joined microsoft about uh, about a year ago uh, massive influence, you know, he's just, the way he thinks, I would go 
to his reviews with everything buttoned up everything prepared for that review thinking you know all my you know uh, you know checks are in place and then he would throw a curve ball a question which i was like why didn't i think of that before and i would look mm-hmm. like like a fool then but then he he pushed the thinking so much and i i, I learned a whole lot uh, from him i mean he used to think like 5 years ahead uh, massive uh, massive influence great guy thanks oh wow yeah sounds like some amazing people uh, yeah. so what have you as observed lately that reminded you that people are good with with uh, with the pandemic right uh, mm-hmm. you know we i'm not sure if you are aware in india there was a massive uh, labor migration that happened because people uh, were not getting <clears throat> enough uh, uh, jobs to sustain so all the migrant laborers were moving back to their to their hometowns and <clears throat> a lot of uh, people from the public including some celebrities came forward and and shouldered that responsibility in addition to the government of course uh, mm-hmm. but the way people supported each other that uh, that was a, a good feeling that you know people look people look after each other and back so that's the uh, good news in the humanity that still exists oh yeah absolutely uh, i hadn't heard about that but it's so nice to hear that you know the community and even celebrities were taking care of those individuals Yeah, absolutely. Uh so who is the kindest person that you know? Um it's an uncle of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh but he's supportive to so many people. He goes out of his way to support causes and and people and basically be <clears throat> um and doesn't tell anybody about it actually. So you really had to dig deeper to find out okay what is he supporting right now. I mean um uh, he he has donated his kidney uh he has uh, sponsored kidney transfer to too many so many people despite not having a great uh, you know income he, he he was not like very rich or something but then very mm-hmm. big hearted very big hearted he supports uh, so many individuals uh in in education sector in in health uh, related issues you know so that's a great uh, individual again to learn the 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 element of uh, philanthropy from without being too rich yourself wow yeah sounds like such a great person to have in your life yeah um looking back what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career mm, actually nothing i mean i think it's a uh, <laughs> uh it's good not to know too much about uh you know stuff it's best to learn uh, and experience from your ex- experiences i don't really wish to know anything uh at that point in time which i know right now because then otherwise i would have uh not learned it the hard way i mean, i i'm a believer in learning it the hard way you know through experiences so uh the the from the school of life <laughs> yeah um, yeah nothing yeah i agree Yeah, you know, we definitely learn from, you know, the mistakes we make and learning the hard way and if we know too much, you're right, we might not um take those lessons to heart. Absolutely. Um so what's the best piece of advice that you've received and who gave it to you? Mm, best piece of advice. Uh best piece of advice I got from actually my um uh best friend uh you know he said look beyond uh put yourself out of an of an issue of a situation step back mentally step back and look at it from a third perspective and and then you would be able to see how petty things are and you would be able to see the bigger picture right so that's a great piece of advice i got from him actually he opened the door uh to spirituality for me because he kept on giving advices like that and actually he practices <laughs> as well so yeah because at the end of the day things are uh, you know much larger than 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 you think of right it's uh, that entire universe is so big and there are you know bigger schemes at at play <laughs> yeah it's so true such amazing perspective Uh, so what advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours or just a successful career in bids and proposals maybe um so in general you know 
be so so content new your know your stuff right uh, never stop learning keep uh, keep developing additional uh, skills and knowledge right that's important mm-hmm. secondly yeah. uh, secondly connection uh, connections have helped me a lot uh, and that's how people take decisions that's how people do, take buying decisions as well right so mm-hmm. uh, be very very networked so uh, content uh, connection and third is communication learn how to articulate uh, the way that the audience gets it not the way you want to tell the story the way they would uh, listen or they would appreciate or enjoy the story right so those three c's i think are uh, a piece of advice that i want to give anybody yeah such such great advice um so we're curious sanjay what is next for you you've achieved so much what are you looking forward to in the future Uh, honestly uh, <laughs> i i think i haven't achieved a whole lot i mean uh, <laughs> there's so much to do now i'm i'm thinking of uh, you know going further down uh, downstream on the sales cycle so if you if you think of a sales cycle you know it start with uh, the the planning part of the the sales the lead generation the uh, uh, opportunity surfacing a uh, opportunity qualification the the proposing and defense and and now moving into the uh contracting side you know legal contracting delivery so those are the elements that i want to consider so that i get the end to end view of the entire uh you know uh business of 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 a company so Oh wow. Yeah, absolutely. And so many of us never get that experience, you know. It's great that you, you know, that's what you want to do. You want to have that full picture. It'll really make you more well-rounded than most of us. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Well, so that's um all the questions that we had. Was there any part of your life or career that we didn't touch upon that you wanted to discuss? Uh No, so maybe APMP India. Uh, I can talk a little bit more about APMP India. The association has been uh, has been has been great. Uh, we have a bunch of initiatives uh, going right now. You know, I'm uh, also leading the Marcom community, the Marcom uh, committee at APMP India. We we are, you know, trying to increase the APMP India members. Uh, generating better brand awareness and and outreaches for that um uh, increasing the uh, connectivity in association with uh, with with colleges and and corporates mm. just generally establishing the APMP India brand in a bigger better way right so that's uh, one area that uh, is is something that probably we uh, didn't touch upon as well and and i don't know maybe, maybe uh, Get, getting into bit bit more formal sharing of my uh, you know experiences and, and knowledge with the wider community uh, you know so that uh, people benefit from it <laughs> going forward yeah absolutely it sounds like you know you personally and APMP and India you know are doing some great things to improve you know the bid and proposal industry more than just within your own organizations but a wider community and that's that's so great yeah thank you <laughs> well sanjay thank you so much for your time today it's really been a privilege to have you with us here at scribble talk We wish you all the good health and happiness. Please continue to inspire the bid and proposal professionals around you um, and everyone else around you as well. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. Thank you Ashley. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm uh, I'm honored uh, to be here. Uh Bhaskar, thank you so much. Uh, really uh you know, enjoy conversations with you and and our association as well. Uh so thanks once again and and uh, be safe stay safe be healthy thank you bye 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 to our listeners thank you so much for tuning in please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes if you've enjoyed today's interview don't forget to subscribe review and share the scribble talk podcast We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Sundram. Signing off. <laughs>